Lab. And that will be my transition from Yannick to John because the startup company we're gonna hear about came out of the Institute for Genomic Biology and it's a proud success story of theirs. Um, John Cole received his PhD from the University of Illinois in physics, and in particular, as I maybe uh, mentioned, biophysics, which is another one of these interesting hybrid types of expertise, a mixture of physics and life sciences. He met his co-founder, Joe Peterson, while they were both graduate students, and they launched a company that is doing really impactful work. Uh, the company is called Symbiosis. It's located here at the Research Park at Enterprise Works Incubator. They are using computational biology to help treat cancer. This includes having better targeted treatments based on individual genetics. So I'm going to turn it over to John, and John will tell you more about Symbiosis. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Laura, for the introduction, and, and also thank you, uh, Yannick, for the, the, the fascinating talk. Um, my name is John Cole. I am a co-founder and chief science officer for Symbiosis here in sunny Champaign, Illinois. And today I'm going to be telling you about our work to make cancer care more precise uh, and more personalized. Um, So one in eight women uh, will be diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetime. And the good, the good news is that there are currently nearly, um, nearly two dozen highly effective breast cancer chemotherapy regimens uh, that are available to them with more, um, with more on the way all the time. Um, these regimens differ in terms of the, the, the drug combinations that are used as well as their doses, uh, dosing and scheduling. Um, the unfortunate, uh, one of the problems though, is that these, uh, these uh, drug regimens tend to be used relatively interchangeably. Um, and treatment recommendations are often based on, on physician experience. So uh, we conducted a survey of over 100 oncologists at a recent uh, major breast cancer uh, symposium and we asked them a simple question, you know, what would they recommend for a fairly typical hypothetical patient? And what we found was surprisingly little concordance in their treatment recommendations. Um, women who seek uh, second or, or third opinions um, from, from doctors also find this uh, routinely. Um, and the problem is that these decisions really do matter. Not all patients respond the same way to different drugs and different drugs have uh, very different uh, risk profiles. So for example, two of the most common regimens that are used to treat breast cancer, uh, ACT and TC, differ in their use of uh, the anthracycline, that's the A, um, uh, the anthracycline doxorubicin. Um, this drug is associated with cardiotoxicity and secondary leukemia. And while it's, uh, it's been shown to give some benefit you know, over, over large patient populations, on the individual uh, basis, some patients don't actually respond to it very well at all. So for example, in the, in the plot here, the, the red dots actually represent clinically measured um, tumor volumes for a specific patient that underwent this ACT treatment. Uh, the first, during the, during the anthracycline part, during the doxorubicin part, um, the patient doesn't respond very much at all. You can see the, uh, the second dot uh, at week 10 is just about the same volume as the first dot, but they respond beautifully to the taxane-based uh, treatment, which is the second part of that, that regimen. Um, had a physician been able to predict this, uh, they very, might, very likely would have selected the, the taxane-only regimen, the TC regimen, uh, in order to one, uh, you know, not subject the patient to the risks associated with the anthracycline, but also to be able to just give them a better outcome overall. Um, and this is what our technology, um, which I'll sort of go over over the next couple of slides, is meant to do. It predicts how individual patients respond to different drug treatments. Uh, in fact, the green and blue lines shown here on the plot are actual predictions from our technology. Um, uh, and they're predicated, they're based entirely on, on, on pretreatment uh, data. So our product, the Symbiosis Tumor Scope, um, 
is, is designed, as I said, to, to, to predict how individual patients' tumors respond to a range of different uh, chemotherapeutic treatments. Uh, it ingests a number of disparate um, uh, data types, including medical imaging, pathology data, uh, standard sort of patient demographic and, 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 and uh, medical history information. And it brings all this data uh, together and integrates it into a really comprehensive uh, biophysical model of the tumor and its surrounding tissues. Uh, these models account for uh, a variety of different important uh, biological phenomena, uh, including different chemical reactions that are happening within the tumor microenvironment, uh, differences in metabolic behaviors of the different cells within the microenvironment, as well as uh, drug sensitivities and, and, uh, and pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And we actually simulate, uh, using biophysical models, we actually simulate these models uh, to, to, to uh, predict how individual patients respond and ultimately pull these together into diagnostic reports that can be used uh, for treatment planning and, and, uh, and data visualization. Now, the core technology uh, is really this biophysical simulation. And it's a multi-scale um, uh, modeling framework that, that, that spans a number of different length and time scales from what we think of as sort of the anatomical scale, large scale structure of the tumor and its surrounding tissues, down to sort of a mesoscopic scale, which we think of as the tissue scale, all the way down to what we think of as the cell scale. And that's where sort of the, the intrinsic biology of the different cells um, are, are taking place. Um, at the anatomical scale, this is where we start to think about how the, the morphology of an individual tumor and the surrounding tissues impact, uh, impact uh, drug response. Uh, we use uh, convolutional neural nets and uh, specifically UNETs, which have become the sort of de facto standard for medical image segmentation in order to build uh, 3D models of the tumor surrounding tissues like fibroglandular tissue, uh, adipose tissue, as well as the uh, blood vessels themselves. And the blood vessels are really important to our models because they serve as sort of the, the sources and sinks for um, a number of different chemical species. These include the drugs that need to diffuse into the tumor microenvironment in order to um, affect the cells, as well as nutrients like glucose and oxygen, uh, certain key amino acids that are, that are necessary for the, the, the cells to survive uh, and grow and ultimately die. Um, at the, the tissue scale, so this mesoscopic scale, we, um, is where a lot of the sort of biophysics is happening. Uh, it's at this scale that we account for uh, the advection and, and diffusion and reactions of different chemical species within the tumor microenvironment, as well as how the, how the, the sort of biomechanics of the tissues as different regions of the tumor grow or die in response to their local uh, chemical uh, environment. Um, and then all the way down at the cell scale, like I said before, this is where we really incorporate a lot of the, the internal makeup of the cells. Um, cancer cells from patient to patient uh, differ significantly in the genes that they express and how, uh, at what levels they express those genes. And those manifest in, in surprisingly different um, uh, sort of biological behaviors. One of the most important for, for our modeling uh, is how different, uh, different patients' tumor cells uh, can be in terms of their metabolic behavior. We've analyzed over 1,200 uh, breast cancer samples, um, transcriptomes, and, uh, and uh, classified them into approximately 13 distinct metabolic categories or phenotypes. Um, these metabolic phenotypes differ in their requirements for different nutrients, um, such as oxygen and glucose and lactate. Um, and, as a, and because the tumor cells and the surrounding tissues have to compete for the available nutrients, these differences in sort of uh, internal metabolic requirements actually lead to starkly different or, or, or sharply varying uh, gradients in, in chemical availability throughout the tumor, and in turn uh, lead to spatially varying growth and death rates at different locations within the tumor itself. 
Um, in very much the same way, uh, great spatial gradients in, in, uh, uh, in drug delivery uh, occur within the tumor. And as a result, cells in different regions, be they closer or further from a given blood vessel, uh, may experience very different uh, local concentrations of drugs that are, that are being administered. At the same time, cells, um, depending on their in internal biology, uh, may have different sensitivities uh, to, uh, to different drugs. And so we use sort of machine learning models to, to try to predict how sensitive individual patients are to, to a given set of drugs. And, and also this, these sort of spatial models to predict uh, how well dosed and in turn how effectively killed the cells are in different regions of the tumor. Um, so we, through a sort of a standard iterative time stepping scheme, we actually run these uh, simulations out for uh, weeks or months of, of um, simulation time or, or of treatment time and compile them into uh, easily digestible reports. These reports include side-by-side -side comparisons of different possible treatments, um, as well as 3D visualizations that can be scrubbed in time, uh, rotated about, so that uh, both the physicians and the patients can get a better sense of, of how different treatment possibilities will affect their tumor. Um, we've been working hard to validate our, our methods. Um, We've been working uh, using both uh, uh, sort of, um, publicly available data sets as well as uh, in partnerships with a number of hospitals that we've been working with. Uh, we're validating our, our methods both in terms of the prediction accuracy uh, of overall tumor volume and longest dimension, as well as tumor morphology. Here um, on the slide, you can see a couple of examples. Up here on the top, you see a very uh, sort of solid tumor that over time is predicted to break down into sort of a, a, a scattershot um, um, sort of cloud of, of tumor. And in fact, when we analyze that patient's MRIs, we see the same type of, of, of final, uh, final, um, uh, final, final morphology. Um, that's not always the case. In, 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 other, in other examples, we see uh, fairly solid tumors that, that decrease more concentrically and wind up being, in this case, a, still a multifocal tumor, uh, but, uh, but uh, not quite so cloudy. Um, overall, the prediction accuracy in terms of volume uh, is extremely good. We have, uh, I think, our median absolute error in terms of predicted response is right around 4%. And our, um, our, our error distribution is, is strongly peaked right around zero. Um, I, I want to say that you know, uh, while I'm representing the company, I am uh, only one part of, uh, of a truly amazing team. Um, and I want to acknowledge some of the people that I work with. Um, they're both friends and, 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 and amazing colleagues that I learn from all the time. Uh, in particular, our CEO, Tushar Pandey, uh, what my, my co-founder, uh, Dr. Joseph Peterson, also I mean, practically a brother to me, uh, and uh, my dear friends, uh, Tyler Ernest and Mike Halleck, who have been with the company almost since the beginning. We also have a fantastic uh, team of, of uh, board members and advisors and uh, a, a really great group of, of uh, investors that have helped us along the way. Um, and with that, I would love to open up the floor to questions. I know it was fast, and I apologize for that up front, uh, but I only had a 10 minute time slot. John, we've got a few minutes, and we have a question. The first was, what cancer do you target next? And what are the challenges from a machine learning or AI perspective in translating that science to other cancers? Yeah, this is great. Um, so the, the next one on our roadmap uh, is uh, lung cancer. In fact. Um, a lot of that work is already underway. Um, we're following, in some respects, we're following a lot of the same sort of um, sort of biological clues that we've that we've come to understand through our work on breast cancer. Um, but in some ways, uh, things uh, are also very different. Uh, lung tumors, for example, in breast cancer, the the, the segmentation uh, work that we've done. Um, was uh, was trained using MRIs, which are this sort of the standard of care for breast cancer. 
Um, in lung cancer, they use CTs and sometimes PET imaging as well using um, um, uh, FDG, which is a, a glucose analog. Uh, and that's really exciting uh, and we believe will be actually an untapped resource. Um, the, the PET in particular is cool because it gives a sense of the actual metabolic behavior of the tumor cells. And so we're hoping to be able to leverage that, leverage that directly um, in, in when we, when we build up the sort of metabolic models of the, of the lung tumors and, and select on a patient by patient basis. Very interesting. I know many people have been impacted by breast cancer in their families or loved ones. So yeah. I think the work is incredibly important. I'm curious as you shift to lung cancer, I've actually had two people that I know in my life that have been diagnosed with lung cancer that have never smoked. Do you see any difference in the therapeutic treatment that will be applied as you address that cancer based on that personal, personalized experience? Um, so personally, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply sorry uh, to, your, to your, uh, for, your, for your friends. Uh, they, uh, getting lung cancer, having not been a smoker, I, I can't even imagine the devastation. Um, uh, as far as treatments uh, within lung cancer, one of the most exciting things that's been happening over the last couple of years is the introduction of um, uh, immunotherapeutics, particularly uh, the PD-1 targeted Keytruda, also known as pembrolizumab. And these, um, one of the insidious things about, about cancer is uh, a lot of tumors develop uh, abilities to evade the immune system. Uh, and one of the ways in which they do it is through uh, uh, um, the interaction between two molecules, uh, PDL1 and PD1. Um, these molecules sort of signal to an, uh, to, a, uh, to, uh, to an immune cell like, oh, don't worry about me, I'm normal, don't kill me. Um, and uh, Keytruda and other um, similar molecules uh, have been developed to, to prevent that, that interaction. Um, they, it's, really revolutionized the way that lung cancer is treated nowadays, um, although it doesn't work for everyone and it's slowly making its way into breast cancer. That's one of the most exciting uh, areas that we've, uh, we've been working on specifically with respect to our, our, uh, our work in lung cancer. So we're gonna be running out of time here, but just in the last minute while we have you, tell us a little bit more about just being in a startup company and what it was like to go from being a graduate student on campus to a founder of a company. <laughs> um, it was surprisingly easy. Uh, I, I think a lot of people don't expect that answer, but it, uh, I have, um, I, I've been very fortunate in, in the people that I've gotten to work with um, they're, you know, amazing people and they've, you know, made the whole process. I think as a, as a team, we've made the process uh, of, of starting up this company um, really easy on each other and on ourselves. We were really fortunate as well. We had, um, we had, uh, we had obtained uh, some startup funds through the SBIR uh, grant process. Um, through the, uh, the NCI and that, uh, that made the first year possible. And then uh, Enterprise Works where I am here uh, right now, um, you know, if it weren't for, for these facilities, I mean, we'd be, we'd be in a garage somewhere, which would be fine, but <laughs> this place is amazing. It's, it's been, I think Champaign-Urbana has been a very welcoming place for small businesses like well, we're so glad to have Symbiosis and you and Joe as co-founders building your business at Enterprise Works at the Research Park. Thanks for sharing your story today, John, and thanks for all the important work you're doing to treat cancer.